This, <clears throat> they have this new policy that when they want to destroy a house, they want to make sure that, you know, n none of the terrorists or their families are in the house. So what they do is they shoot something uh, near the door or near the house or near the, on the roof. And this is the warning side to get out. They, they pre-warn the enemies to get out of the house that God forbid that we should eliminate uh, potential Jewish murderers. Um, in a central base here in, the, in Samaria, in Shomron, soldiers are told to use karate and kung fu tactics against women terrorists in order not to upset the Muslim population. You know, like this is, uh, remember the song like, you know, ah, Bruce Lee, like, what in the world, like kung fu fighting? You know, it was, it, it, those kicks were fast as lightning. Instead of upsetting the air of the Muslim residents, so when you're greeted by a woman terrorist that's about to blow you away, make sure not to shoot, please, because that's going to antagonize the Arabs. Make sure to pull out your closely move and kick it out. A year ago, a Arab uh, truck driver ran over a group of soldiers. Uh, it could be seen anywhere on the YouTube. You see all the soldiers ran away. When they were asked why they run away, they said that's the policy, to run away. Actually, it was not everybody ran away. There happened to be the tour guide who was giving the soldiers a, a tour at the time. He was the only guy, even though he was injured by that incident, the Arab uh, truck driver uh, ramming and rolling over people, running over people, he was the only person that went and... Uh, uh, chased after, tried to get that terrorist. Well, since then, folks, I'm happy to, uh, to tell you that he has not been invited back to any more tours for the IDF. He's not our kind of man, of course. And just two days ago, this is really up to date, just two days ago, there were four soldiers that uh, their ways was ways off, and they got into, uh, uh, they went into Janine, they're all armed, all soldiers are armed, and uh, they almost were lynched there. Nobody fired any shots. None of these soldiers fired any shots. They have guns, they were all armed, and they were attacked by a mob. Nobody got out, nobody stopped to shoot, nobody ran them over to stop the incident. Actually, they were bloodied. And, uh, of course, there was a girl, a girl soldier there, and... Uh, uh, it's not such a pretty face to see what happened to her. The last point we made about the murder of uh, Rabbi Itamar Bengal was that this happened uh, the week of uh, the time when we read the portion not only a portion of the week, but an additional, additional portion called Shkalim. Shkalim is also next to uh, the one after this. This is a, a time of year where we read four special additional portions to the portion of the week. The first is called Shkalim, which means uh, coins. Second one is Zahor, to remember what the uh, arch enemy of the Jewish people, Amalek, did to the Jewish people. And, of course, Purim is Haman. Haman was a descendant of the Amalek uh, family. So let's see the connection between uh, what happened to Rabbi Itamar, what's happening to us every day, Jews being attacked, and let's discuss the connections here. So number one, it says in the Talmud, Yerushalmi, the second page, um, the second page, first side, it says the following. Rabbi Abba says, the son of Rabbi Acha, that it's hard to understand the Jewish people. When the Jewish people were asked by the multitudes, by the Arab Rav, those converts that left Egypt, but not for the sake of heaven, 
kind of like hitchhikers jumping aboard the bandwagon, joining the bandwagon. So when they came and they asked the Jewish people to join in with them to worship the golden calf, the Jewish people agreed and they gave tremendous amounts of money, silver and gold in order to build this golden calf. On the other hand, look at the Jewish people. When Moses comes up to them and says, listen, we need money to build the tabernacle, they also gave tremendous amounts. So Rabbi, Rabbi Abba is saying, I really can't understand these Jewish people. So uh, the second connection between uh, money, coins, and this time of the year is we find in the tractate of Megillah, page 13, side B. It says the following, Haman was, was willing to give 10,000 shekel, 10,000 coins, to King Ahasuerus in order to agree to his plan to uh, annihilate the Jewish people, to, to, to uh, genocide against the Jewish people. He was willing to give 10,000. So uh, Reish Lakish comes around and says the following, that God understood that this wicked person, Haman, was willing to, uh, to sacrifice so much money for his hate program to annihilate the Jewish people, that Hash God made sure that the Jewish people would have a merit when it comes to money. What would the merit be? That from the time that the Jewish people were in the desert, Moses collected money, okay? And the various commentators explain that if you take the amount of Jews that gave this half shekel coin, it comes up to amazingly to that same amount of money that Haman gave over to the king of Hashverosh, uh, which is 10,000 pieces of gold coins. So Haman was a person, he knew a lot of details in the Torah. We always know that there were tremendously wicked dictators. They knew a, a thing or two about Judaism. So it says here that God knew that the day would come where a person would sacrifice such a large amount of money for an evil, you know, he's willing to lose all this money for an evil proposal. So we, we need the Jewish people for a positive, for a holy proposal to be willing to give up their money. So that's why uh, when it comes, every year when it comes to the month of Adar, in the times of the temple, and also today we have a custom to continue this, when Adar comes in, hits in, and before Purim, we give this half shekel coin. We give this half shekel coin. Uh, remembering the merit of the Jewish people that we too are willing to give of our monetary, of, of our finances for, for good causes, for the sake of, for, for charity and for the sake of heaven. So, listen to this. There's an amazing, we're going to read an amazing line here. On this, on this Gomorrah, there's a commentator. The book is called Asefat Kenim. It was written by Rabbi Natan Svi Hirsch Passis. And he writes an unbelievable Torah. And remember, engrave this on your heart. And it has to be, this has to be passed on to all. He talks about the connection between these two, uh, these two Sabbaths, the Sabbath where we read Shkalim, giving of the coins, and the Sabbath before Purim, when we talk about the mitzvah to remember to annihilate Amalek that came to annihilate us. And he speaks about the connection between money and the enemy, annihilating the enemy. Listen closely to his words, remember them forever. He says the following, here's the connection between the two. When God saw, God knew that there would come a day when an evil person like Haman would be willing to forgo so much of his money because of his hatred of the Jewish people in order to annihilate them. This would cause a tremendous boomerang a uh, prosecution against the Jewish people. Why? Because here we have a guy who's willing to give up such a substantial amount of funds, of his money, 
in order to annihilate the, his enemy, being the Jewish people. And then, this is going to be a reminder, listen to these words, this will be a reminder that the Jewish people, in the time of the judges, and in the time of the prophets, they did not expel the uh, Gentile inhabit inhabitants from the land at the time that they were conquering the land of Israel. Why? Because of the fact that they wanted to utilize this, these inhabitants for cheap labor. Can you imagine this? This is an amazing piece here. They left. One of the major reasons that God tells them when you come into the land, you have to expel the inhabitants. So why were so many inhabitants left? Why were so many tens of thousands of people left? And here we are showed the tremendous secret here. The reason why they were left is because the Jewish people wanted to make some bucks on their backs. They wanted to save some money. And this way they would have the use of these nations to, to be their workforce. And we wouldn't have to pay double or triple salary for the same work for Jews. So this, and it even gets better here. Listen to his words. Because of the fact that they, that they uh, desired their money more than God's commandment here to expel the inhabitants, instead of, and what happened was, because of their love of money, this erased their hatred that they should have had for their enemies. Can you imagine? This is like the news today. This is like the news today. I mean, I hate to say it, but where Rabbi Itamar was killed, where he lives, in the Mount Bracha, and in most settlements, and in most places in Israel, we are utilizing cheap labor. Instead of paying Jews a regular or normal salary that they could live, respectively, we are, we are favoring, because of saving a few shekels, we are favoring the enemy. And the Asifat Skenim in his commentary is saying it, that a love of money came and instead of hating the enemy, we began to, we began to hire the enemy. And he says, and he brings it down now to the story of Purim, that the same thing is true. Why was, why did King Saul keep the king of, of Amalek, uh, why did he allow him to live? God gave him a commandment to eliminate all forces, all people in, uh, that are part of the Amalek nation. So why did he leave the king? So the Torah teaches us that the reason why he left the king of Amalek was because of the fact that he thought that we could get rich. If we kept the king alive, then we would know where his treasures are and his wealth is, etc. So that's why he kept the king alive. God says to eliminate all of them, uh, all these Amaleks, and he does not listen. And it all, it's all stems from money. So that's the connection, folks. An amazing connection between the Shabbat of coins, of money, and remembering what Amalek did to the Jewish people. This is the connection, and this is what's happening here in the land of Israel. Because of a love of money, instead of the money going to, to, to fund the Jewish people and to fund people that are our family, the Jewish family, we are giving, because we want to save a couple of shekels, we are giving our enemies a tremendous base and foundation to continue living in the land of Israel and uh, slowly eating away and destroying the country here. The last thing I wanted to say here, are we okay over here? Okay. Last thing, <clears throat> one of the last things here. I wanted to read statistics. This, this is, you could find them. A website called OECD. These are facts that compare Israel uh, 30 years ago in 1987 compared to Israel 2017. So this is pretty 
this is pretty up to date. Listen to the difference, okay? We're talking about money. We're talking about, we know that money uh, can do great things. It builds the tabernacle, this week's portion. But also money does terrible things. Number one, money built the golden calf. Number two, it says in the Torah, don't let money blind you. Number three, we see in the land of Israel, we are keeping, you go in the cities, who's in all of the stores? Why don't they hire Jews? There's so many Jews that are out of work. Why aren't they hiring Jews? You know why? Because of cheap labor. They're utilizing the cheap labor that the Arabs, because who don't pay taxes, they're able to pay them much, much, much less. So in order to progress, in order because of money, this is blinding the hatred that we should have for our enemies. And instead of hatred for our enemies, we're hiring the enemies. So listen to the statistics here. Amazing statistics in the last 30 years. In, 19, in 1987, there were 4.4 uh, million residents in the land of Israel. 30 years later, there are 8.75 million residents. It's an increase of 99%. Uh, life expectancy in 1987 was 75 years. Today, it's 82 years. This is an A. This is... Uh, 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 increase of 9%. Uh, for, for every thousand uh, residents, citizens of Israel, uh, in 1987, 171 out of 1,000 people had vehicles. Today, out of every 1,000 people, 398 uh, people have vehicles. It's an increase of 133%. Tax burden on the citizens in 1987, the you have to the the tax bracket was 45 percent. Uh, today it's gone down to 30 percent. The amount of the burden of taxes have gone down on the citizens of Israel by uh, 33 uh, percent compared to 30 years ago. The commodities of Israel, what Israel produces. In 1987, it was $35 mil, million. Dollars. In, in 2017, 30 years later, it's gone up to $358 uh, billion. Uh, dollars. It's an increase of 923%. The GDP, the gross domestic product of Israel, in 1987, uh, was uh, 8. Today, it's 41. That's an increase of 413%. The GDP went up 413%. The foreign exchange reserves in Israel were, in 1987, they were uh, $4 billion dollars. Today, there are $112 billion in foreign exchange reserves. It's an increase of 2,700%. Energy, uh, independent energy in Israel. In 1987, Israel had independent energy, 4%. Today, it's 65% of the energy that we have is independent. It's an increase of 15, 1,525%. The inflation, in 1987, the inflation rate was 16%. Today, it's 0.3%, a decrease of 0.98. Once again, what are we doing? Are we building golden calves? Are we building places of holiness, places of Torah, of modesty? What are we doing with this money? Is this money blinding us? As it says, do not accept money because it's a bribe. Do not accept money. A judge is not allowed to accept money. So are we accepting bribes? Are we, do, are, are we utilizing the money for good purposes? Are we trying to turn Israel into some kind of modern European uh, country here? The, there's, a, uh, there's an expression in Israel. There's, excuse me, in the Talmud. It says in the Talmud, that the redemption of the Jewish people will not come till they despair from the redemption. 
till they will despair from the redemption. Now, if you go around the uh, religious Zionist community in their yeshivot, they have a line that uh, they have, maybe it's from Rav Tzviuda Kuk, uh, who explains what does that mean that the redemption will not come until the Jewish people are despaired from the redemption. So Rav Tzviuda, I think, not sure that he says it, but it's definitely said uh, in his name, they mention that, uh, what does that mean? Is that people are despairing the way that God has chosen to bring the redemption, which means people are despairing when they see the Knesset, when they see the IDF, when they see you know, the state of Israel, how it's being run, they are despairing because they say that that's not the redemption, that's not the way God's going to be, be, bring the redemption. So that's what they're saying. So they, they're all smiling and saying, that's what the Talmud is saying, that the, the redemption will not come until we will despair from the way that God has chosen to bring the redemption. And God has chosen the, the secular way of government, secular way of the army, uh, the, the way the country is being run now. This is the way that he's chosen to bring the redemption. And these, the religious, the black hat communities, they are despairing from this. So therefore, the redemption is very close. I've always felt that this was not correct. I always felt something else, but I was a little bit shy to say it until I found that uh, in Europe, the, uh, the, the uh, head of the yeshiva of Tells, Rav Yosef Yehuda Leib Bloch, in his, in his work, in his uh, composition, Shiurei Dat, the third volume, page 65, he says an unbelievable thing, and this is what I was thinking. I'm just going to add a little bit to what he said. What does it mean that the redemption will not come until the Jewish people until the Jewish people despair for the redemption from the redemption? What does that mean exactly? Exactly. So he says the following: that during the generations there were many that made, many people that made a mistake as far as the redemption was concerned. For example, in previous generations, there were many, many people that believed that the way to bring the redemption was through all types of modern, uh, using uh, holy names, using Kabbalistic kind of uh, methods to bring the redemption. Uh, and in our times, once again, this is uh, probably uh, 90 years ago, 100 years ago, so in our times, we have people that believe that with all kinds of, uh, uh, with all kinds of, where's his words here? Um, all kinds of, uh, of physical, uh, physical ways and all kinds of trickery to bring the redemption. People think, so I'm going to take his words and just like refine them a little bit. What I think the rabbi is saying here, and it's pretty clear, you know, he was talking about, he was talking about the beginning of the Zionist movement. So he's talking about all kinds of natural ways to bring the redemption. So year, you know, hundreds of years ago, people tried, tried to bring the redemption through spiritual, quote unquote, spiritual ways. Now they're trying to bring, bring it through natural means. And the redemption will not come till we despair from these types of means. But my humble opinion is the following. That what the Talmud was telling us thousands of years ago is the following. That, and this message is especially for the religious Zionist community. That the redemption of God will not come until we despair from the secular form that we see here in Israel. We've allowed them 70 years. It's coming up now. 70 years. It's a long time. 70 years. We've allowed them. They've been in the army. And they're in the media. And they're in the government. And we said that if we just, you know, become involved in the government, if we become involved in the media, if we become involved in the army, if we become involved in all the wings of, the, of government and, and running of the state, we will change it around. But we see the truth of the matter is that the spiritual, the spiritual state in the land of Israel has gone down as what we read in all these newspaper clips, 
for all not newspaper, all these uh, internet clips, we see on one hand for sure there's there are many thousands of Jews that are strengthening themselves. You know, don't we don't fool ourselves for sure. But there's a small group, and they're not going anywhere. And the damage that they're doing to the Jewish people, if it's Sabbath observance we talked about last week, this war against Judaism, they are succeeding more and more and more. And the redemption will not come until we realize that the redemption is not coming through this vehicle. The vehicle of the Knesset, the vehicle of the IDF as it stands today, the vehicle of the present state of Israel, it will not come. And we have to wake up. It's only going to come when there is an ideolo ideological revolution, when there is a Torah revolution, that the Torah, true Torah people in the land of Israel will create an ideological revolution, changing the thought process in this country. We're, as long as we keep on wasting resources and our time and our breath and our lives to join the forces of the Knesset and the IDF and all these other came groups that of course there are good things that all of them do but all in all we are taking our minds off the redemption the redemption will not come until we despair from these organizations from this okay from this uh from the establishment it will not come we will there's no way that the redemption will come because the redemption will be stopped. They will fight against this type of redemption. They're not going to bring it. They will be the first ones to fight. That's why it says in the book of Zechariah that, that parts of the Jewish people will fight against the coming of the Messiah. That, in my humble opinion, that is what, what it, the Rabbi Bloch is saying here, that the, the redemption of the Jewish people will only come after we despair from that the uh, present establishment of the state of Israel will bring upon us the redemption. That has to change. Until that time where the revolution, the ideological revolution will come, I wanted to remind all of us that every person in the state of, in, in the land of Israel is a soldier. Whether you're wearing green or you're not wearing green, you don't have to wear green because every Jew, if you're driving, if you're hitching, if you're outside, wherever you are in this country, you are a soldier. And there are laws of soldiers in the, in the Torah. And the Torah tells us, the Rambam brings it down in the book of Shoftim. On uh, chapter 7, law 17, says the following. That a soldier goes out to battle, he has to forget about his family. He has to forget about his kids, about his friends. Why? You have to be totally immersed in your mission. The mission is to save the Jewish people. Your mission is to sanctify God's name. And any person that's fearful, and any person that uh, that uh, gives off fear, or, or, uh, or influences people to become frightened and fearful, these people have blood, Jewish blood on their on their hands. This is an amazing law. This we have to always remember. When we ever come, if any of us have a thought, maybe I won't travel, maybe I won't hitch, maybe I won't go outside, you know, maybe I won't go to the market. When you have these thoughts, remember that this is no time. There is now a war, not from today, not from yesterday, for a long time. But every one of us is a soldier in the Jewish army, in the army of God. And we are not allowed to show fear. We are not allowed to do things that are going to make ourselves fearful or put fear in other people's uh, lives. We have to show strength in order that the enemy understands that, okay, we are not afraid of them. Because once they, if the enemies, if they sm sniff out that we're afraid of them, we're finished off over here. So remember this law in the Rambam. Till the day comes of the revolution, the ideological revolution, which will come very soon in the land of Israel.